Hello and welcome to All the Games You Like Are Bad. I'm your retired member of the Legion of Doom, Mark Bigney, and today we're going to be talking about Assault on Doom Rock by Tom Stasiak. You know, in many ways it's really hard for me to remember what it was like ten years ago. No, 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 further back. Further back. Uh, yeah, that's probably about right. When there was a real dearth of dungeon crawl games. You couldn't even really get many good fantasy adventure games. People were so desperate for this kind of experience, they were playing games like Cave Troll and Dracon as though they were dungeon crawl games. And into this world, we had, you know, Hero Quest and Advanced Hero Quest and Warhammer Quest, which in many ways, to many people, are still the standards of the genre. But by the early aughts, these games were painfully out of print, and even the ones that weren't were already starting to show their age. And then Fantasy Flight released Descent First Edition in 2006. And it was the standard bearer for a very long time, or at least what felt like a long time. Descent, however, had some problems that even Fantasy Flight seems to have tacitly recognized with their attempts to revamp the system. Descent was a slog. You spent a long time killing inconsequential mobs, figuring out fiddly things like line of sight and movement capabilities and counting squares, and the setup took forever. And since then, there have been a fascinating number of iterative improvements on this fundamental genre. And one of the things I'd like to highlight in this development was a design in 2009 by a designer by the name of Croc, who released Claustrophobia. In many ways, allow me to emphasize, Claustrophobia is not a dungeon crawl. It has some of the thematic elements of a dungeon crawl, but mostly it's sort of a one-on-one -on -one tactical combat experience. And that is what many people want out of a dungeon crawl in point of fact. What they want is that tactical combat. What Claustrophobia did was it looked at the genre and said, how much of this can we get rid of and still provide a satisfying experience? And the answer, as it happens, is a whole heck of a lot. Claustrophobia gets rid of the setup problem by having a randomized stack of tiles. It furthermore has these tiles contain exactly one square in each of them, and the tiles are huge. Partially as a result, movement capabilities and ranges in claustrophobia tend to be things like one. One is the movement value over the overwhelming majority of the time. If you're moving two spaces in claustrophobia, you're going real fast. Ranged combat is rare, and when it happens, it's just, eh, target things in an adjacent hex. No line of sight rules, no engagement rules, just target something in an adjacent hex. Despite this, because of the underlying combat systems, claustrophobia is still a very engaging game to play without having to do any of that fiddly nonsense that you would take up to five hours doing in a game like Descent. And so claustrophobia, at least conceptually, I think, opened up the genre to asking the questions of what do we want to keep, what do we want to get rid of? And some of these innovations, like using tiles for movement instead of just individual spaces, were followed on in the Wizards of the Coast Dungeons and Dragons adventure games. And a lot of people hate those games. I still have a bit of a soft spot for them. I thought they were kind of uh, clever in a number of ways, even though they were very simplistic. But since then, in those past six years or so, we've really had a deluge of fascinating designs. And as a result, you don't have to make compromises. Do you want one versus all or co-op? Do you want miniatures? Do you want deck building? Pretty much any permutation of these mechanics are available in some kind of tactical, squad-based or lower combat game. And I, for one, am extremely pleased by this because I love this genre and I'm willing to play almost any number of games of this ilk. But let me tell you why I'm talking about Assault on Doomrock. For one thing, first of all, Doomrock has a very novel and compelling theme. Precisely because it's a fantasy game that avoids almost all of the Tolkien-esque tropes. Fantasy, especially as represented in board games, has basically not evolved since the 1950s. We still have the same old elves fighting the same old orcs, fighting the same old or uh, dwarves, many with all the same ethnic and racial stereotypes that were, in, uh, that were imbued in Tolkien's time. And it gets a little tiresome. Personally, I haven't seen the same kind of stagnation in sci-fi as represented in board games. And I know for a fact that fantasy literature has all passed Tolkien, so I find it fascinating that a lot of board games haven't. Doomrock, on the other hand, has its tongue very firmly planted in cheek. It seeks to actively subvert a lot of the fantasy tropes. For one thing, your heroes aren't even remotely heroic. They do terrible, mean, petty, spiteful things, even to each other. And they're deliberately self-deprecating. 
You might play as the frustrated mage, or the smelly paladin, or the cowardly fighter, or uh, things of that nature. You're not going to see them engaged in acts of tremendous heroics, in part because they're going to die, more on that later, but also because the game system act actively makes fun of them. Your enemies are also goofy. You're going to be fighting exploding tomatoes, or a sharknado, or other ridiculous enemies that do ridiculous, albeit deadly, things. Whether that's a pro, or a pro or a con is up to you. But allow me to emphasize one aspect that really, really spoke to me. Heroism is a currency in the game, and you spend it to do various things, either to boost your attacks or you give it up to, say, rob a local shopkeeper. And it's represented by somebody throwing up the horns. And that's awesome. It's also very metal. However, it's worth noting that the designers, possibly because they're, uh, they're Polish, or possibly just because it was an oversight that we've all played victim to, they're not actually throwing up the horns. They're giving the American Sign Language symbol for I love you. We've all made that mistake, haven't we? You know, we've meant to, you know, hail the, 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 the righteous tunes and accidentally just given our regard to the world. Uh, so I'm willing to forgive that than that. This is also exemplified for what it's worth in one of the characters. The bard has an axe. That kind of axe. Isn't that cool? I think that's hilarious. You may think it's stupid. If you think it's aggressively stupid, Doom Rock is not for you. If you think it's stupid and awesome, the way I do, then listen on. It's also worth noting that Doom Rock is possibly the single hardest co-op game I have ever played. People talk about co-op games being hard. I remember when Ghost Stories were released, people talk about how incredibly difficult it was. Uh, some people find Pandemic incredibly hard. Uh, but let me tell you, Doom Rock is the honey badger of board games. Doom Rock don't care. Doomrock will beat the crap out of you, steal your lunch money, beat the crap out of you again, insult your mother, and then beat the crap out of you one last time for good measure. I've only won it once, but when I won it, it felt great. Most other co-op games, you know, you might have a win ratio well in excess of 50 or approaching 50, but this is the first co-op game I've ever played where my win ratio was well south of 50%. And when I won it, it was totally legit. I didn't cheat at all. No house rules or variants whatsoever, and it felt great and well-earned. As a result, we have a very interesting tone in Doomrock. Again, the farthest thing from heroic fantasy uh, possible. Instead, we have grubby jerks scrabbling it out in the dirt for some measure of survival. It's not a dark, overarching tone like you might find in other games like Kingdom Death Monster or, you know, super serious zombie survival games. No, it's all lighthearted, but at the same time very grim. And I quite like that juxtaposition. It's, it really speaks to me, and I think it's amusing, and if nothing else, again, it serves to differentiate it from the masses of other games of very cookie-cutter fantasy, or even sometimes sci-fi themes. So that, I think, is definitely one of the selling points of Doomrock. So let's talk about the mechanics of Doomrock. Doomrock, again, is very much in this design tradition of what can we get rid of to focus on the compelling stuff. Now, in Doomrock, you're not going to be fighting hordes of undifferentiated enemies. In Doomrock, you're going to have three fights. Exactly three fights. Any one of which might kill you dead. So there's no stupid kobolds that you need to spend three hours murdering for no great effect. There's no gradual wearing down of an invincible character until they, they die through a thousand cuts. Oh, you will be worn down, but it probably will be much faster than that. Uh, because the fights in Doomrock are intense and tightly focused. And they're about dealing as much damage as you can and maximizing whatever abilities you have to great effect. Because those fights are brutal. The way it works is there's an admittedly very simplistic dice allocation system, and that's probably one of the weakest elements of Doomrock. The way that you activate your abilities is very, very simple, and sometimes even frustrating, because you're just only able to activate abilities for which you roll the right number. And if you throw your fistful of dice three times and the right number doesn't come up, that can really stink. But it does its job. It's not the best, but it works. And the tactical system on which this is all uh, superimposed, the activation of these abilities, is so well done and such a work of genius. Allow me to explain. There's no grid system in Doomrock. There's no hex system either. There's no system at all. It's a purely abstracted system of movement. Position matters, unlike games where position is completely abstracted, but it is leveraged and, and sharpened to a fine, fine point that Doomrock will then shove in your eye for no reason. In Doomrock, you're either by yourself or next to something. And if you're next to something, you're also next to everything else in that group. And that's it. 
That's how positioning works. You don't have a movement capability. When you move, you move to a new group. That's how you move. That's how it works. You're either next to something or you're not. No line of sight, no ranges, no movement capabilities. Done. Simple. And despite the fact that it's so simple, you get a lot out of this. The AI that drives the monsters, therefore, is also very simple. You just tell it to move to a hero, and which hero it moves to can be a function of a number of other very, very simple parameters that you as a player might seek to exploit. But the difference between a ranger and a thief can nonetheless be leveraged here. A ranger has a ranged shot that can't be used when monsters are next to it, and it's used to target a distant monster. A, a, a thief, on the other hand, can become hidden when they're not next to anybody. And then they can move next to somebody and then backstab them. This is great. It captures all that great elements of all those great elements of tactical combat and a plurality of different kinds of abilities and playstyles without any kind of overbearing, overarching square counting. We've all been in that position. Okay, one, two, three, four. I don't want to be there. Okay. One, two, three, four. Okay, I can't reach that other place. You're only counting to four, but when you've counted to four by the 17th time in a given game, I personally am ready to swear off Arabic numerals for good. Now, I will note, despite the fact that I'm praising the variety of different playstyles uh, that you're able to leverage in the simple system, one thing that Doomrock deliberately doesn't do is it doesn't allow for tanks. There, there's, there is an ability called tank, but it doesn't really tank you up all that much. You're very vulnerable in Doomrock. Partially that's dif difficulty, but it's partially also the design decision, I think, to not let fights drag on too much. Things are always going to bleed you. You can't hold off the tide. You can't stand in front of people and t absorb blows while people in back of you do interesting stuff. So everybody's got to maximize their offensive capability most of the time. Now, that doesn't mean that you always only attack. Support abilities matter a great deal, but don't think that defense is going to win you the day. Defense is very much underprioritized behind things like movement capabilities, behind things like uh, terrain manipulation, behind things like offense. Personally, I find that a bit of a downside. I quite enjoy being tanks. I like defensive. Uh, I like defensive style characters, but I also like playing, you know, leadership style characters that buff other people. So there's room in Doomrock to play to things beyond just hack and slash, but not necessarily everything. Another very simple thing that Doomrock does to leverage a lot of detail while not letting things bog down is in the exposure system. In other games, broadly speaking, if you want to harm or hinder another character but not actually damage them per se, you, give them, you might give them a condition like, okay, you can't move next turn, or next turn you have one fewer action, or something like that. Doomrock has a bit of that in the die-stealing mechanic, which admittedly is not my favorite either, but most of the time when, it's, when you want to be able to affect somebody negatively, but in a general way, it gives you these exposed counters. Exposed counters are revealed and executed the next time a character is damaged or hit. And what this does is it gives a lot of subtlety without constraining you. The subtlety is that it's another resource that you can manipulate in the game. There are a whole bunch of abilities that rely on a target being exposed or a target being unexposed or consuming the markers or putting more out or, or controlling where they go, taking your exposure markers and moving them to an enemy. Lots of really interesting stuff like that that are that's more textured, more nuanced, and more interesting than simply do some damage. It's also worth noting that this adds a subtle element of risk into the game because that's one of the only areas of random chance in terms of the attacks. When you attack something, it's just going to take a fixed amount of damage. But you don't know what those exposure markers are. Some of them might be more damage, some of them might not be more damage. So you get a lot of really interesting detail and combat texture through a very, very simple mechanic. And that's, an er that's another area in which the simplicity of Doomrock really works to its advantage without sacrificing any of the interesting uh, tactical decision making. And so, don't get me wrong, Doomrock is a lot longer and more intense than a game of, say, Claustrophobia, another game I really like. Claustrophobia is, you know, a 60 to 90 minute experience tops. Doomrock will easily last you 90 plus minutes, probably closer to two hours, even if you're playing solo. And let me use that to segue into my next topic, which is the exploration mechanic in Doomrock, which I both love and kind of dislike. I love it because in the exploration mechanic of Doomrock, you basically have a series of cards that provide a menu of options. These options might cost you time, or heroism, or hit points, or give you exposed markers, or they might give you back hit points, or take away exposed markers, etc., etc. You get a tremendous amount of variety of options and things to do and places to go, and it's all very simple because it's all on the cards. Your basic options are go to a different card, or do something that's on your current card, and all the options are printed on the card. So rules-wise, it's incredibly bone simple. But in practice, there's endless variety, or near endless variety. 
that's when you're playing by yourself. When you're playing with other people, the exploration phase can drag because every decision is done by committee. And in fact, the rules are paralyzingly silent on how to resolve any disagreements. Not that you tend to have disagreements, but in other games where you're talking for too long, the, the start player may say, well, you know, it's my call, we're doing this. Uh, and it's just a way to expedite the discussion. Doomrock doesn't have that. And so because you're making all these minor decisions by committee, sometimes the exploration phase can just drag on beyond, beyond its point of, uh, beyond its expiration date. So that's worth noting. It's also been a common cause of complaint that the exploration cards are too small. And as a result, people sitting around a table won't all be able to see what all the individual options are. And that further makes the exploration phase take a lot longer because everybody needs to explain what all the different options are over and over and over again. Does it get tedious? Sometimes. Is it worth it? I do. I wouldn't want to play this game often with four. Out of the box, the game plays one to four, and I would say top it out at three, especially for your first game. If everyone's super experienced, maybe four will work. And there is virtue in having more people involved, because with more people, they're better able to, you know, look at their array of special abilities and leverage them to maximum effectiveness, and it also helps deal with main moving all the monsters. If you're by yourself, you've got to do everything with respect to the antagonists all by yourself. But with people around to help you, it helps alleviate some of the mental strain of dealing with both your character and everybody else. Now, this also leads me to uh, the expansion to Doomrock. Doomrock came out with an expansion a year after it was released called Doompocalypse. And there are, roughly speaking, two different, kind, two different things in the expansion. One of them is more cards for everything. And these are great! You know, more different kinds of goofy heroes you have. The aforementioned Bard is in the expansion. The aforementioned Sharknado is in the expansion. Sorry, Shark Tornado. Sharknado is copyright of some weird movie theater, a movie studio, and I wouldn't want them after me. They might unleash, unleash any number of irradiated half-creatures to come tear me apart. The other thing that the expansion releases is terrain. Onto this abstracted combat setup, we now have usually two to four pieces of terrain that are on the map. And again, they work just like characters in that they're either next to something or they're not. And everything next to them is next to everything else in that group. <sighs> terrain is both awesome and terrible, and here's why. It's awesome because it's, again, a very, very, very simple system that gets a lot of different variety of effects. Every terrain has a number. And the lower the number is, generally speaking, the more dangerous the terrain is. So, for example, a pit trap would have a very low number, and generally speaking, when you shove a, a, a creature away, it goes to the lowest unoccupied piece of terrain. Very simple. I whack you, you have an exposure marker that says you've been pushed, you get pushed into the pit trap. Very nice. Very satisfying. On the other hand, though, in terms of the number of effects that each terrain has, they can vary from one to about five. And sometimes they even have three effects on one side, and then something causes them to flip, and then they have three different effects on the other side. And honestly this very quickly can start to feel like too much. Too many things to keep track of, both in terms of just adjudicating what happens over the course of the game, and in terms of what best to do in terms of your tactical options. So I'm really of two minds about the train. It's really nice, it's really clever, but at the same time, it takes a game that's already full of detail and texture and might start to push it into the realm of what I would call overbaked. One too many things, it was just in the oven a little too long, needed to be brought out sooner. So I don't really know whether I can recommend the terrain unreservedly. I say give it a try, uh, preferably with somebody else's copy. But for, for me, sometimes I wish it wasn't there. Uh, and so sometimes I want to play with it, and sometimes I don't want to play with it. It's really, it's, it's, it's really a judgment call. So at the end of the day, to summarize, I think Doom Rock is a fascinating design from a mechanics perspective, but also from a thematic experience. And if you're all interested in looking at what this genre of, you know, sort of tactical, squad-based or lower combat experiences that are within striking distance of an adventure game or a dungeon crawl game, I really recommend Assault on Doom Rock. It's really impressive. On the other hand, if what you're looking for is the same old stock heroic fantasy thing where you go and lay waste to a whole bunch of kobolds and then level up and feel like some sort of demigod, this is not the game for you. I suggest you stay far away from this and keep playing whatever raffle stomps you want to play. And if that's your bag, I forgive you, but that's not how I want to roll. Thanks very much, and take care.